Tonight on Brewmasters, I've been brewing up a new idea for an old beer. We're headed all the way to Cairo, Egypt to bring a 4,000-year-old beer back to life. We almost hit the donkeys. Have you ever gotten it in accidents? Once a week. The key to this beer will be wild Egyptian yeast. Donkey's very excited about our expedition. No one has lizards in his beer. You'll be the only one. It's a total gamble. I hate this. Meanwhile, the brewery has their hands full with another ancient ale, Chateau Giahu. We could end up having to part with this entire 200 barrel beer. I'm swimming in beer. A great craft beer begins with a great idea. You want to be where it's at? Join me in this vat. I'm Sam Kellajoni, founder of Dogfish Head Brewery. My team and I make off-centered ales for off-centered people. We brew it, we ferment it, we cool it, bottle, keg, ship, rinse, <laughs> and repeat. Well, I'm swimming in beer. Beer, 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 it's time to get a beer. I'm Sam Kellajoni. I founded Dogfish Head Craft Brewery over 15 years ago with one mission in mind, to create beer for people like me. Beer with muscles in it. First 20 pints gets a free sailor cap. Off-centered ales for off-centered people. This cockamamie idea actually worked. It takes a one-of-a-kind crew to make a one-of-a-kind beer. We were considered to be kind of weirdos and heretics and freaks. And they're like, oh, what's dogfish are they going to put in the beer this time? For instance, I'm sitting on a pallet of Midas Touch right now, which is a 2,700-year-old recipe found in Turkey. Midas is only one of our ancient ales. We also produce sati based on a 9th-century Finnish recipe, theobroma, a Chilean chocolate concoction inspired by the Aztecs of 1200 BC, chicha, an ancient Incan brew made from chewed corn and human saliva, and Chateau Giahu, the oldest known fermented recipe in the history of civilization. Ancient ales are just great beers because they're liquid time capsules, and they certainly validate our off-centered position in the beer community of saying, beer is whatever you want to make it. The beer we want to make today is Chateau Giahu. The recipe for this ancient ale is based on molecular evidence from pottery shards that date back to 7,000 BC. Today's not typical because we're doing the Jahu. Ah. It's something like seven or eight ingredients. So they're pretty labor intensive. You're just gonna be working your butt off. Jiahu is a really challenging beer to make because to be as historically accurate as possible, we use a sake rice as the base. In addition, there's hawthorn fruit, hops, and honey. Brewer extraordinaire Chris Wood is at a critical point in the brewing process, the boil. The boil is where specialty ingredients are added to the wort or young beer. We're just starting to add the honey, uh, a thousand pounds of honey. It'll take a little while. Chris only has an hour to get the large quantity of Jiahu's specialty ingredients in before the boil ends. You want to give your ingredients the most amount of time in contact with the wort. If you put it in at a later time, it might not get absorbed into the flavor, compromising your beer. This particular beer, Chateau Jiahu, it's been a bit of an issue for us, fermentation-wise. Chateau is a problem beer, especially because it's so new to us. This is only our third time doing it at this scale. We actually had to dump a batch. Uh, it didn't ferment all the way. Basically, it stopped fermenting at about 12 Play-Doh. There's always a level of you're not quite sure what's going to happen. After the boil, the wort is transferred to the Whirlpool, where Chris must add the final ingredient, Muscat grape juice, which will add distinctive flavor notes to this 10% alcohol beer. I need to hook up the muscat to a pump to feed it into the whirlpool. And I don't know where the hose is. I gotta go look around the cellars and see if I can find it. I guess somebody took it. They didn't know I needed it. When things outside of your control kind of go wrong, it's stressful, yeah, it is. Chris found the hose, but now he only has 10 minutes to get the muscat into the whirlpool. If the muscat doesn't make it into the whirlpool, this Jiahu batch will be incomplete. We got everything in at the time that we needed to. I think this is going to be a good batch this year. Now, the brew is complete and Jiahu is ready to go to the fermenter. Meanwhile, I've been brewing up a new idea for an old beer. 
Egypt was such an advanced civilization and beer was such an integral part of that civilization, I don't think our ancient ales program would be complete without an ancient Egyptian ale. In both of these instances, we work with Dr. Pat McGovern, a famous molecular archaeologist who's kind of the Indiana Jones of ancient beverages. In most cases, he analyzes DNA evidence from artifacts to identify ingredients that may have been used thousands of years ago. But this time, Dr. Pat takes me to UPenn's Lower Egyptian Gallery for inspiration. It's a false door it's where food would be given over to the deceased, and beer happens to be the first one listed. And that's beer in hieroglyphics. It looks like a jar with a loaf of bread over it. You know, if we go to Egypt, you know, we're going to see lots of these. Go to Egypt? I like Dr. Pat's thinking. The best place that we can really get information about beer making are the tombs. And there's one tomb in particular which is the earliest depiction of beer making anywhere in the world, called the Tomb of Tea. We go there, come up with the most appropriate recipe, source the ingredients, bring back whatever we can, you know, from Egypt, mm -hmm. brew it at Dogfish. So we'll decide today it's definite. Uh, let's, gonna, go, let's go with it, I think. We're going to bring a 4,000-year-old brew back from the dead. This one's going to be awesome. Days like these are my favorite because an idea is moving towards an actual beer. There have been a few previous attempts to brew an ancient Egyptian ale, Newcastle's Tutankhamun ale, Kieran's Old Kingdom beer, and Anchor's Ninkasi. But we're going to try something the others haven't. Beers like these are really challenging to make you're kind of brewing off the grid. So there's a ton of creative conjecture that we have to do as brewers to bring these beers from hieroglyphs on a wall and make them truly come back to life in liquid form. I'm thinking about doing something wild for this Egypt brew, something the ancient Egyptians were probably doing without even realizing, using wild yeast captured on location in Egypt. Gathering wild yeast on location won't be easy. Yeast is a crazy organism, and there's many different branches, as Katrinka, our resident yeast expert, can explain. The most important is Saccharomyces. In the Saccharomyces family, we have two different kinds of yeast. Baker's yeast, which we use to make bread rise, and brewer's yeast, the only alcohol-tolerant yeast. Brewer's yeast, that is one of the most awesome organisms there are, is a single-celled organism that produces ethanol for us. It's cool because it makes beer. Saccharomyces occurs naturally on the skins of grapes. Yummy. Which was helpful back when they first started making wine. We didn't know anything about microorganisms. They would just kind of mash grapes up and put them in a big pot and let them do their thing, and wine would eventually form. In brewer's yeast, there are hundreds and hundreds of strains. At Dogfish, we have 32 different strains on file. I spend most of my time working with doggy yeast, which is our proprietary strain. Doggy yeast smells very unique and tastes very unique and it's a huge part of our flavor profile. Different yeast strains impart unique flavors to a beer as a byproduct of fermentation, which is why it's so important to brew with the right strain. Jesse, you ready for it? Yeah, I'm coming. All right, let's do it. I don't know how the team is gonna react to my wild yeast idea, but before we bring this Egyptian beer back from the dead, I gotta get Brewmaster Flores and Head Brewer Jesse on board. For this Egypt brew, I think we should explore wild yeast. Oh, wow. Wouldn't it be cool if there was a way we could just, in the night air of Cairo, capture yeast out of the air? You are talking truly going to Egypt and like expose the Petri dish, get whatever is in the air somewhere along the Nile. Pull from the air whatever's in it, pollen, yeast, bacteria. Yeah. That would be interesting. Of course, with your schedule, Big F, can you join me at least for part of it. Go to, to, Egypt. to Egypt? And be like the yeast whisperer. Wow, that I think would be pretty wild. Yeah, very wild. Uh, uh, Flores gone wild. Oh, Flores gone wild. Man versus wild. I've never had a date in Egypt with anybody. No, pretty exciting, right? That was romantic. You still want to be part of this? <laughs> I'm all aboard. Let's do this. All right. Jesse all right. and Flores seem psyched to explore the wild side of yeast despite what all good brewers know, that yeast can be highly unpredictable. Back in the lab, Katrinka's been keeping an eye on one of our other ancient ales, Chateau Giahu, because we've had trouble fermenting it in the past. This batch has been fermenting for two days in the tank. 
By now, the specialty sake yeast should be eating sugars and producing alcohol, but it's not. We have a problem today. Our chateau is really slow. Not only are we slow, I think we're really stuck. When yeast is stuck, it basically stops eating, falls asleep, and sinks to the bottom of the tank. What was our gravity today? It's 9.34. So yesterday it was 9.34 also. So this looks like solid stuck. No, we're good. Yeah, we're good and stuck, yeah. Uh, that I don't like. This is always hard because we are only a small team, but we are working against billions of yeast cells. John Carpenter, our assistant brewmaster, has a plan. Jesse and I are going to go out there and we're going to dump out the yeast in the cone that's dormant and we're going to revitalize that with fresh yeast. This maneuver is called repitching. The new yeast in the Jiahu tank will then be recirculated in the hope that the yeast cells will start eating again and get back to work producing alcohol and CO2. Right now we're moving the really nice vital yeast out of this fermenter and over into the Jiahu. We're hoping that it takes the food that's available in that and we get that nice fermentation profile that we were looking for. Within 12 hours, we'll know if we're good with this again. Worst case scenario, we're going to have to end up dumping this whole fermenter. We've got 200 barrels of beer in there. We're looking at a loss here of fifty to $75,000 of sold product. Coming up, Floris and I travel to the land of the pharaohs in search of the perfect ancient ale. This looks like a, a bushel of wheat. Eureka! And it's all hands on deck at Dogfish to keep a watchful eye on the progress of the Jiahu brew. We could end up having to part with this entire 200 barrel beer. In our quest for an ancient Egyptian ale, Floris and I find ourselves in modern day Cairo, Egypt. Crazy, I love it. Leading the expedition, our guide, Rami Romani, an expert on life in Egypt, past and present. Yeah. Look, look over. We're on a research mission to understand the process of beer making in ancient Egypt. <laughs> Rami's driving us to the outskirts of Cairo, but getting there is half the adventure. Wow, look at that guy. <laughs> Horses and donkeys, why can they go against traffic? And cars have to go one way. <laughs> We're <terminated. laughs> That means your mother is a prostitute. No! Oh, that is... I swear, I swear to God that is. Rami, have you ever gotten in accidents in downtown Cairo? Yeah, I would say once a week. Okay. What happened? Hey, he just told you that your mom is a prostitute. Yeah. This is the Nile. Look at this. We're now crossing over the Nile. Wow. As we head towards adventure, the road gets rougher. It's a shortcut. We're good. And bumpier, and narrower. I just hit a wall. Until we finally hit the edge of ancient Egypt. It's like the city ended and we're in the middle of nowhere. We're headed to the land of the dead to find out what the mummies were drinking 4,000 years ago. Oh, Once there, we meet up with Dr. Pat and Nigel Hetherington, an Egyptologist who can interpret hieroglyphs. This is the entrance to the Tomb of T. The Tomb wow. of T was discovered in 1865. T was a nobleman of the 5th dynasty, roughly 2400 BC. He had over 100 titles, including overseer of the pyramids. This is T. This tomb is a sort of comic book of Egypt because the reliefs show everything that he wanted to take with him to the afterlife. These are magical reliefs. They can come alive in the afterlife. Torches on in here, and now we get right through to the storerooms. This is where we based all the interpretation of bread and beer for 200 years in ancient Egypt. For Flores and I, this is like a Rosetta Stone visit. This is like the birthplace of our vocation. This is the first depiction of the brewing process. And to see it so lovingly and carefully presented by this important person in this society feels pretty great. You know, it's saying basically what you guys do is, is important. We have two registers of brewers and then two sections of bakers. Then we finally end up with the scribes registering what's going on because you've got a your taxation, bureaucracy, crazy. That's the accountants. <laughs> That's the accountants. 4,000 years later, and at least we know that hasn't changed. 
But the theories surrounding how beer was actually made in ancient Egypt are varied and still under debate. One of the main theories is that the beer was made from bread. So that's why the brewery and the bakery are next door to each other all the time. There's a description which says, kneading the uncooked bread. Of course, this is where the whole story started with the fact that beer in ancient Egypt is made from bread. It quite clearly states in there that there's bread involved in the process. Another person, he's labeled as molding the loaf. So he's making a loaf of bread, he's making oblong lumps. In front of the man stirs a mixture in a large container which rests on the pedestal. The scene is described by the word dint. Some believe it's a soaking, probably referring to the soaking of the lumps of bread. And then to mix it in the deep container to make a liquefied dough, which then you get to that pouring of the dough. This indicates that the bread loaf is somewhere the source of the yeast. In this era, they didn't understand what yeast was. It was a microscopic organism, so there's no reason for them to depict yeast. All they need to depict is the bread, and yeah. something right. magical right. happened on the bread. They were adding the yeast, just they didn't know that they were adding the yeast. This depiction, it's here for his life in the afterlife. It's not for us. So even though it's a good guide into how beer was made, is this the way it was really done? Or this is still heavily debated today, whether or not that was the process. T left other clues for us. I think my favorite are here these women. Maybe because it's women. Scantily dressed. This looked like a bushel of wheat or something. Emma was the choice. Emma as a grain. Emma wheat was one of the first grains to be domesticated 10,000 years ago. It became a daily staple of the ancient Egyptians and earned the nickname Pharaoh's wheat. She's a brewer. No doubt about that. I think uh, you've got one of the raw ingredients of our beer right there. Eureka! I love the fact that we're not 100% sure of the process. My initial perspective on a brewer is I see this tapestry interwoven between baking and brewing on this wall is these things are very much integral to each other. Beer back then was not just for adults to go back home and get smashed. That was not the case. Everyone used to drink beer. Rather than drinking water straight from the Nile, which is really bad for you, you wouldn't want to be working, carrying five ton stones on your back, and then going and eating dry bread. You want to eat and drink at the same time, which is beer. You just have the beer. It's clean, it's good, it's nutritious. There's a point I've been making. Beer is a food group. The word bread in ancient Egypt meant life too. The word bread, ta, meant life. And at the ancient Egyptian times, they would say, ta hunkut, bread and beer. Ta hunka. Ta hunkut. Ta hunkut, bread and beer. Ta hunkut. Yes. What about that as the name of our beer that ta we make in Egypt? Uh, that's an idea. What's I like the idea like? of people in Delaware saying, I'll have a ta, ta hunkut. Yeah, okay. Cool. Which is Let's sustenance. Do it. And you should call it Rami too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get back to you on that one, brother. Rami's ta hunkut. Hey, we should go out there right now. A liquid lunch. I am parched, Rami, I'm parched. Imagine what that beer tasted like when that dude put that top rock on that pyramid in the sun. It was like, boom, it is done. How good did that beer taste? He probably deserved it more than all the beers we've had in our entire <laughs> life. Back at Dogfish, John and Jesse have their hands full. Follow the hose. The brew house needs to stay on target, making approximately 9,000 cases of beer each day. And they've got to troubleshoot one of our ancient ales, Chateau Giahu. After a successful brew, the Giahu fermentation was stopped dead in its tracks by some sluggish, sake yeast. With the specialty things that we do with our beers, they're tough beers to ferment. They're, they're interesting beers. They're not your norm. So we have some different ingredients in there that might require some more special attention. In an effort to save the 200 barrel batch, they added a fresh batch of sake yeast to the tank, hoping the new yeast would jumpstart the fermentation. We really want to fix this one if at all possible. Chateau Giahu is a once a year specialty beer, so having to dump it, that stinks. It's extremely costly for us to dump a beer. All of the, the materials that go into the beer are completely wasted along with the huge amount of man hours that go into each of the beers. It's not cheap, it's, it's real money. <laughs> and that's the part that stings the most. There is positive pressure, so I can, you know, I got CO2 coming out, so it's kind of vigorous is what we're looking for. Not quite enough to make you pass out, though? No. 
happily fermenting yeast eats the sugar and farts CO2. So the bubbling in the bucket is a good indicator that there's fermentation activity in the tank. If we end up having to dump this batch, we'll have to start calling distributors and, and let them down, which is a really, really tough thing to do. It's going slowly, and I think we'll have success with it. Patience, and we'll be good. The Egyptian pyramids were built on beer. Back in 2500 BC, the minimum wage for a day's labor was two containers of beer, or about a 12 pack. Stonecutters, public officials, and slaves were all paid in the same way. Floris and I have come to Cairo, Egypt to bring a 4,000 year old beer back to life. After seeing the oldest depiction of the brewing process still in existence, the brewers and the academics are divided over whether bread was used to make beer in ancient Egypt. The Nile may be cool, but the bread and beer debate is just heating up. Scientific evidence doesn't back up that the bread was in the beer. Why would they have chosen to depict all of that on those walls? They are so intertwined. That they they which can be explained. Mm -hmm. Explained because well, be? Egypt is bracketed in between the Near East, which has bread beer, and Nubia, which has bread beer. Breweries tried to make it before that way, and it tastes horrible. Okay, and I know that that us, apparently is our modern flavor. I can't accept that the most powerful people in the world drank crap beer for 5,000 years. The debate that we've been embracing passionately and with brotherly love tonight is about the whether beer was made with bread or they were two separate staples of the diet of the ancient Egyptians. We certainly know they're both really important to them, but whether they were actually combined in the process is something that is going to be part of our exploration of this ancient beverage. Dough was obviously the magic thing for them. We know what yeast is now, but a lot of people have never known that they did know that putting this with the other mixture that it would start. Should we incorporate bread into the making of this beer? I vote Dude. for bread. I think you have to because the pictorial evidence seems to be so strong that you have to prove it wrong. And by proving it wrong, you mean make a bad beer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sounds like we got a majority thinking, it, yes, they were combined. Cheers to the best ancient Egyptian beer yet to be made. Let's yeah. Uh oh, we got a bit of a log jam. Now it's time to get wild. We're gonna capture wild yeast on location here in Egypt. Rami is taking us into the heart of wild yeast, Tawar. Sounds like we're going yeast hunting. We are yeast hunting. We're headed to a date farm to set our yeast traps. We very much want an agricultural area because yeast is much stronger and it's alive. I think this is a good area if I see a lot of fruit. All oh, the giant trees pregnant with clusters of dates. That definitely means it's an environment that could be rich with yeast. And after all, we'll be right next to the pyramid. Look at that. Oh, wow. Whoa, I didn't see that. There's no guarantee that our plan will work. But if we can collect yeast that's alcohol tolerant, we have the potential of creating something totally unique that's never been done before. Wow, I think we're there. In order to capture wild yeast, Floris brought along a kit with collection dishes that will set up in potentially yeast-rich spots on this date plantation. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Do you want me to carry you over? You can't do a roll-on on a tree. a tree bridge. Are you okay, guys? Yes. Yeah. Good. All righty. We're good. We prepped the petri dishes with nutrient-rich agar and smushed dates. The perfect yeast food. These are gorgeous dates right off of the trees. All that activity there is mold, yeast. That's exactly the environment that we're looking for. We top it all off with a perfume that yeast-bearing flies find irresistible. Isoamyl nitrate. I just want to say this is the strangest picnic I've ever imagined I'd be on. The donkey's very excited about our expedition. If you can be under the tree. We're looking for areas that might be rich in fruit. I'm going to yes. go around the back. Excuse me, excuse me, ladies. We'll leave our petri dishes out overnight so they'll absorb as much yeast, mold, bacteria, and whatever else the balmy night air has to offer in the hopes that we'll catch an alcohol tolerant yeast strain. Yeast is airborne and around us almost all the time, but we only want brewer's yeast. So you're definite on this piece of cotton right now, there is yeast, but you're not sure if that yeast is the brewing beast or not. There are maybe 12 different yeasts around here in the air. Our game is just finding the brewing one. We need the beast yeast. Yeah, perfect. Are these date trees? No. 
So whoever built these pyramids, they were fueled by beer. They were probably using the night air here to get the yeast, just like I'm doing, except thousands of years ago to build that little tomb there, that little mountain of awesomeness. This, days like this, I know how lucky I am. This is my job, to do this, like in the shadow of something that magnificent. This was definitely a worthwhile trip. Back at Dogfish, John's checking up on the suspect batch of Chateau de Chiahu. Can we take a look at where the chateau that we've got is today? Yep. Thanks. This batch had trouble right out of the gate because of some sluggish sake yeast. So far, the team has tried repitching with new yeast and recirculating to keep the yeast active. They've been monitoring the brew daily to see if the fermentation profile is back on track. It's very difficult to start a stalled fermentation. Oh, I've been hitting it with all kinds of attempts to get it to where it needs to be. So I think the blue line's pretty telling there. We're starting to stall again. Yeah, it looks like we kind of hit a wall. We've got a little too much extract left in there. We're not going to get the flavor profile that we're looking for. There's not a brewery out there who hasn't had to make the call dump or package, and that's what smack dab in the middle of in this one. We could end up having to part with this entire 200 barrel beer. The next morning, we pick up our Petri dishes from the date farm. Flores will take the samples to Belgium, where a special lab will determine if we were able to capture any brewer's yeast. Before he leaves, Flores needs to check in with John and get an update on Chateau Giahu. Did you repitch? We did have a batch that wasn't going exactly to plan. We'll see how that one's doing. No, no, I, I understand. What's the gravity? So you've done that. I just want to know that you have tried everything. Then there's nothing more you can do. Oh, I do not like the sound of that. Cairo, Egypt. While Flores and I have been on a search for wild yeast, there's a really big problem with yeast back at Dogfish. I do need to know that we have tried all our uh, other options. Flores is on the phone with John to discuss the status of Chateau Giahu. Then there's nothing more you can do. All right, thank you. Bye. There he is. How's things back at home base? Yeah, I always feel bad. A giallo. Uh, and yet. Oof. Uh, John just told me that they have three days now with no movement. We've tried spinning the tank. Aeration and pumping over all works if we have a yeast that's yeah. um, active, but there is no active yeast, and I don't see really an option anymore. After several attempts to save the brew, it looks like we have no recourse but to dump it. It's never a good thing to lose a batch of beer, but we only answer ourselves, and we only sleep if we make world-class beer. This chateau does not meet our standards, and it is going down the drain. Stump some beer. Yeah. It feels like a little bit of a death. A little part of your soul was chunked out a, a day where you feel like you got kicked in the groin or your dog died. It sucks because the chateau is a once a year thing, and we do it in very small quantities. Yeast is a living organism, and when you're operating at that high of alcohol content, you're at the ragged edge of its ability to exist and survive in the beer. So sometimes it's just, we had bad yeast. The Chateau was a good beer. It started out strong, pleased a lot of people, and then really didn't do a damn thing. Yeah. Everything we tried to do, recirking, aerating. It was an ingrateful beer. It's heart-wrenching. I feel extremely responsible for every fermentation that goes on in the cellar because I'm producing the yeast for it, which ferments the wort, so I'm directly responsible for that. It doesn't feel good. Company-wide, nobody wants to see that. Basically, money going down the drain. So when that happens, everybody kind of takes it to heart. Would you like to say anything? Bye, Chateau. Flores and I need to stay focused on the task at hand. He's taking our yeast samples to a special lab in Belgium, while I head to Cairo's largest and oldest market. This is my chance to research ingredients native to Egypt, herbs and spices we would never be able to find back home. This is where creative intuition comes in. This is the part of, of recipe building that I'm pretty good at, so I'm stoked to hit that market. This is called the Spice Street. It's one of the biggest spice markets in Egypt. This market assaults your senses. I think if that is one of your ingredients for a beer, come on, no one has lizards in his beer. You'll be the only one. That is deer fat. It's yeah. very good for your sexual organs. Really? Yes. Yeah. You'll be as good as Egyptians in bed. Okay. 
Okay, is that good? Or? Oh, go. Uh, we're famous, dude. We're really famous. Fooling around aside, I find my first ingredient for ancient Egyptian ale. But this is it. That is dome. Dome. And dome are palm sugar. Explosively sweet and kind of tart at the same moment. We have evidence in the botanical record going back 16,000 years ago. So this is a great candidate for adding to our early Egyptian beer. It would have been historically and geographically relevant. This is my front runner right now as an ingredient. All right, what else should we at this one? Chamomile. Okay. Chamomile. And look, All right. Ancient Egyptians called chamomile the herb of the sun. It was used to embalm the dearly departed to prepare them for their final journey into the afterlife. It smells kind of like apple chewing yeah. tobacco. I dig it. Yeah, I think it is nice. Dr. Pat suggests we use zatar. It's a mixture that includes thyme, oregano, and margarine. This is what I think would be really nice. I get lemon and mint. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just such a great spice. Do you think we should do this instead of chamomile? You could do both. And they're both equally accurate in era and geography? Yeah. And the flavors on this beer are definitely going to be more exotic because of the wild yeast approach. Mm -hmm. So I think these kind of herbal spicy notes are going to complement the spicy wild mm -hmm. yeast notes. Mm -hmm. We kind of like went into it blind and learned a lot here as far as the ingredients that were available in 2400 BC. The spicy day of shopping, it was awesome. These are not things I've worked with before, so really what we need to do is there's some tests and some tinctures, in essence make little teas with each of these individual spices in the beer so we get an idea of how it works. So we're gonna go and have a few beers right now in the name of science. Let's do chamomile first. This, I think, will be the most subtle of the three. It's nice. It well, all has kind of a sleepy quality. Evening beverage. Chamomile has good aroma, but I want this beer to have a little kick. Let's go on to Dom. It has a caramely, smoky, earthy flavor. It adds both sweetness and bitterness at the same time. I like that. I'm really looking forward to seeing how these two work together. Next up, we try the Zatar and see what that brings to the table. Ooh, yeah, that's potent. I get a lot of lemon and pepper flavors. Oh, that's the, the, this is your least favorite? I hate this. <laughs> you know what's wonderful is all of our palates are different, and we can drink the same thing and have a different experience. It's just not my cup of beer. No. <laughs> Rami's protest aside, I think the ingredients will work together beautifully in the right ratio. Cheers to dome, chamomile, and zata. Cheers, gentlemen. Now it's time to head back to Dogfish and brew to Hankin, our ancient Egyptian ale. I'm excited to be back at Dogfish and get going on Tahankin, our newest ancient ale. We lost a batch last week, 200 barrels of Chateau Giahu, but we're getting right back up on the horse again. The results from the wild yeast samples florists took to Belgium are due in today. These are the first pictures we got back from uh, Belgium. I'm actually already excited because you can already see yeast. I mean, you can see it budding yeah. right here and so here. here. That is like sexy yeast fornication. That's as sexy as yeast gets. Is it eating sugar? We know that it's consuming sugar. What uh, we don't know really is how alcohol uh, tolerant it is. We know we can make beer. We just not might not be able to make particularly strong beer. Yeah. But low alcohol bread and beer is historically accurate with what the pyramid workers drink. This is another element in extreme brewing. Nobody has actually gone in like hey, I'm gonna go to this country and grab a yeast, that we were able to get yeast yeah. from Egypt, that it's alive, that it's budding. To be honest, I wasn't sure that this was gonna work. It was a total gamble, but the yeast traps worked. We actually managed to capture wild yeast that's likely related to yeast the ancient Egyptians used 4,000 years ago. Well done, guys. We're gonna make beer with the yeast that we got out of the night air in Cairo, so mission accomplished. I don't know of a commercial brewery that's done something like this before. So, we're gonna debut to Hank it for the press in New York City just three weeks from now. It's gonna take us eight days to propagate enough yeast to even do the brew. Once again, we're totally under the gun, time-wise. Of course. Wouldn't be in Otherwise, we don't know how to function. <laughs> To make our Egyptian brew as authentic as possible, we're gonna add another key ingredient, 
bread baked with Emma. We have about 20 loaves of bread that we're going to be making. Never worked with Emmer. Personally, I never heard of Emmer. This was a traditional grain in Egypt, just trying to recreate what they had. Oven. It seems like it would bring a little bit more authenticity to yeah. baking the bread, because I'm um, pretty sure ancient Egyptians didn't have electric ranges. Now, for the Egyptian brew, we're probably going to go using the bread as a specialty malt, adding color to that beer. We're not exactly sure what this emmer bread will add to the mix. It's just another wild card in this recipe. Delicious. Eight days later, I'm headed to the brew pub in Rehoboth to meet up with Flores, Jesse, and Brian. Today's an awesome day because we're making beer. Today's beer is definitely monumental in that nothing's been made like this in over 4,000 years. <laughs> There's the boys. Hey. Hey, Good Sam. Morning. Hi, Sam. I brought you guys herbs for breakfast. It's not just for breakfast anymore. This is a typically back ass word brew for dogfish meeting. We're winging it once again. This is the first time we're brewing with ingredients from Egypt. So we need to come up with a game plan for each step of the brewing process. So this is chamomile. Mm -hmm. Now this is the zatar, which is like a blend of different herbs, but it always has like marjoram and okay. oregano. Did you smell this? This is like absolutely it's terrific. It's like sweet molasses, floral. This is the only thing that might add a little bit of sugars, fermentables. The dom, or palm fruit, needs further investigation. It's almost have an odd node in it. Almost like a, fun, a fungus y. I note, almost like thought rancid, but that's actually yeah. better. Weird. It smells like mushroom. I think you're going to like it because you're a fun guy. <laughs> I think this would be nice in a mash. I agree. And I would like to use the bread the same way, so put the bread on top of the mash so we get some more of the toastiness. Flores suggests soaking the bread, just like the ancient Egyptians did. We've got our strategy. Let's make some beer. It's time to start brewing. OK, what's going on here? Hey, Whipping Dr. up a bat. <laughs> Look at you with your brewer's shirt on. The first step of brewing a beer is mashing in. That's where we mix water and malted barley. For this brew, we'll also be using wheat, emmer, the dom from Egypt, and Jesse's emmer bread. All right, boys, dom adding time. Jesse, you made the bread, you should add it. It looks like an awesome pizza, like that has sausage and garlic. <laughs> After mashing in, we separate the liquids from the solids. It's time for the boil. We're ready to add the chamomile and zatar. All three of those together, that's hard, really. Drops. Mellows out. I was thinking use the majority, but are you guys thinking? Oh. No, 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 no. I was thinking the smaller amount. Okay. Yeah. I think we need to tone it down a little bit. Use only the quarter. Can we meet halfway? You can do a quarter a plus 10 grams. I don't know what a gram is, but. That's why it's fair. It's fair. Sure. Sure. Oh, oh, that was okay. Oh, sure. Snap. Sweet. That was right. perfect. <laughs> Four points. An hour later, we sample the pre-fermented beer to get an idea about how the beer will taste. Nice. Looks good. Beautiful dark golden hue. You get a little bit of brown and red probably from the crust of the bread and from the dom fruit giving a little bit of color. There's a dom coming fruit, definitely. You get the dom? Oh, yeah. That fungus quality to the straight dom is not in the, in the beer. I think it's very nice. This has a potential to be a great beer. A great beer. It's going to tear up. I'm going to tear up. Now, the wort gets sent to the fermenter, where we'll add our wild Egyptian yeast. This is a yeast that's been asleep for 4,000 years, and the mummy yeast, and it's slumbering back to life. Hopefully, it'll wake up in time and eat some sugar. Jesse's pitching the yeast into the fermenter, and Tehankit will now ferment for two weeks. Dr. Pat and I are hosting an event to debut this ancient Egyptian beer, and we're going to barely have time post-fermentation to take one keg of this get it in my truck, drive it to New York. So really, we're going to be trying this for the first time ourselves in front of 100 you know, beer lovers, uh, foodies, and archaeology buffs. So we I, I hope this comes out OK. I hope it comes out all right. Coming up, we got a ton of press on hand to debut Tahankin. Frankly, I haven't tried it. If we screw this up, it'll be all over tomorrow's news. Floris and I traveled around the world and back in time so we could create an authentic ancient experience for the modern drinker. Fearless in our quest for authenticity, we went all the way to Egypt to hunt wild yeast for this brew. We're not in Delaware anymore. 
I'm excited, but I'm pretty nervous. Tonight's the night. We're here in New York City, Times Square. This is the night we're going to be trying the Egyptian beer. Center stage in front of a room full of beer lovers and archaeology buffs. On top of that, we've got a ton of press on hand to taste the 4,000-year-old brew we brought back to life. And so the name of the beer is Tahankin, which is sort of the OG term for beer in ancient Egypt. We just hope the modern drinker will dig it. I'm really, really proud of this beer. Dr. Pat, myself, Floris, everyone worked really hard on this. Frankly, I haven't tried it, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, so if it sucks, humor me. <laughs> Time to open the vault. We're going to tap it and decant it. I'm not going to lie to you, I'm at least going to smell it, but I'm not going to drink it. Floris and I have no idea what to expect. It's carbonated. carbonated. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that it's carbonated, yeasted sugar, creates alcohol, byproducts of CO2, so we got a hint that the yeast did its job. Isn't it beautiful? It looks like a hazy day in Cairo. Sunny, unfiltered, kind of gray, maybe a little smog, but it's, it's a beautiful unfiltered beer, and it's carbonated. This is kind of super exciting because this has something that has never been done before, beer-wise. The truth is, we have no idea what this beer is going to taste like. We haven't done any sensory, and we haven't even had time to tweak the recipe. Anticipation in the room is high. Let's hope this liquid time machine actually works. If we screw this up, it'll be all over tomorrow's news. All right, we're going to go start. Don't drink any. No. Don't even bring you yours up yet. Touch it, touch it. I'll touch it, but don't drink it yet. All right. <laughs> All right, guys, are you thirsty for this beer yet or what? Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. See if everybody can wait. Anyone else? You guys need a pitcher? Don't drink it till everyone has one. This beer made with a yeast that went on a three freaking continent journey into this glass. Literally, Africa, US. Belgium. Everybody have your glasses? In Belgium, when you drink a beer, you have to look in somebody's eyes. When you don't do that, you risk seven years of bad sex. <laughs> so you have to look in somebody's eyes. Don't risk it. Hope you guys all day. To your health. To your health. The moment of truth has arrived. Given that this is such a public event, we should get some pretty honest feedback on Tahankit. So, it's like shutting your eyes and tasting Cairo. I get a lot of dumb, I get bread. It is actually incredible. The, 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 the richness that comes out of it, the, the herbiness deep. Three cheers, It's just like super herby, and when you take the first sip, that's just the beginning. The first thing I thought of when I drank it was yeast. I can smell it. Unlike a lot of dogfish beers, it's not off the charts alcoholic, so you can just drink it and kind of think about it and not feel like your doom is coming with each successive drink. That was something you could drink all night long. It actually brings me back to ancient Egyptian times. <laughs> you get a lot of flavors, but it's very nuanced. It's complex, but it's not over the top. Smooth, a little bit of spice, not a bite to it. Just to look at it. I mean, how could you be nothing like that? I mean, unfiltered deliciousness. Perfect. I kind of like it. Yeah, it is I think it's neat. extremely yeah. drinkable. Yeah. I'm so happy the way this thing turned out. So, well done, gentlemen. Cheers. To the next one. Yeah. Where do we go next? I don't know. <laughs>